Let's talk about disturbing Greek myths. I wanted to make some sort of a top 10 list because it sounds good and because it gives you a structure. Uh, you split everything into 10 segments, easy and effective. And yes, in fact, I did split everything into 10 segments, but it is not 10 myths, uh, but more like a groups of uh, interconnected myths. Uh, there's more than 10, really. I'll try to avoid, uh, when possible, the most obvious disturbing myths uh, for now. Although it is uh, really hard to ignore the house of Atreus or Medea, but I would try to focus on stories that seem not that weird on a surface level, but they become seriously disturbing if you go deeper. Uh, the video is also split into two parts, because otherwise it will be too long. Uh, so if you can't find Medea in the first part of the video, uh, she's probably in the second. Scary Stories – Disturbing Greek Myths Part 1 I'm gonna start with a relatively normal myth, which actually can be interpreted in a way that people usually don't expect at all, even though it is a quite well-known interpretation, and it is not my personal interpretation and uh, the work of my imagination. It is an interpretation advanced uh, by some scholars, and it makes a lot of sense. So the first one will be the abduction of Persephone. You know the story. Hades abducts Persephone in order to marry her. He takes her to the underworld, and uh, Demeter, Persephone's mother, is desperately trying to find her daughter, but she's nowhere to be found. Demeter is the goddess of harvest, uh, among other things, uh, so it has serious consequences uh, to the agricultural situation in the world. Eventually, Persephone is located in the Underworld, but at this point she was tricked by Hades into eating a pomegranate seed, and since she has eaten something that belongs to the Underworld, she always has to return back to her husband. She can come back to her mother only for uh, half of the year, but another half uh, she spends in the abysmal realm of the dead of which she is now the queen, even though nobody asked her if she ever really wanted any of this. Obviously, this is one of these myths about the agricultural cycle. Uh, when Persephone is back, Demeter is happy and uh, nature responds accordingly. And when uh, Persephone comes back to Hades, Demeter is sad and uh, winter is coming. What is mildly disturbing here, at least to modern people, is the fact of this abduction of Persephone. Nobody asks her opinion, Hades just decides to marry the girl, grabs her and essentially forces her into marriage. It is disturbing indeed, but not as disturbing as cannibalism and matricide or killing your children or cutting your brother into pieces or other nice stories. And here comes a deeper level of disturbance. Uh, this myth is not only a metaphor for the change of seasons. It, is, it also can be interpreted as a metaphor for the type of marriage uh, that uh, has been practiced in the ancient Greek states. Not in all of them, obviously. Uh, but in, uh, uh, in a significant part of them. And it actually corresponds uh, very well with the information we have on the state of which we have the largest amount of data. Athens. Persephone is the daughter of Zeus and Demeter. At some point, Hades, a brother of Zeus, comes up with an idea. I want to marry my niece. Hades and Zeus uh, discuss it and come to a conclusion that it actually makes sense. Uh, they don't ask the opinion of the girl's mother, they don't ask the girl. 
their opinions uh, on the subject are irrelevant. Technically, Hades doesn't really abduct Persephone. His actions are approved by the girl's father. Hades has the full consent of Zeus. He's not doing anything wrong. They have an agreement. It is a done deal and uh, Zeus is actually actively helping his brother. In the end, Persephone is married to her uncle, who is obviously much older than her. Nobody cares what she thinks of the situation. Demeter is deeply saddened because she has a suspicion uh, that she will never see her daughter again. And this is a legitimate uh, suspicion. Uh, after the girl is married, it is entirely possible that her mother won't see her ever again, uh, or she will see her only occasionally. Uh, this is a description of a traditional marriage in ancient Athens. This is exactly how it worked in many cases. Not always, obviously, but in many cases. Uh, it is a typical situation, and this myth was very relatable uh, to a family situation of a huge number of people. Uh, this is how they lived. A girl was essentially a property of her father. He could marry her off to anybody he wishes. In most cases, this anybody uh, was significantly older than the girl, sometimes 20-25 years older. It was considered normal and probably even preferable. There was a lot of logic behind uh, this idea, because if a guy is getting married when he is over 30, uh, then there is a chance uh, that by this time uh, his father will be dead and he will inherit uh, his property, which solves the problem uh, with uh, where uh, he should live with his wife and their kids. It obviously created a very interesting dynamic uh, within the family. It was also possible that a girl will be married off to one of her relatives, like in this example with Hades, to her uncle. Uh, why would you do this? Oh, family property. Women couldn't inherit property, they could only be uh, temporary caretakers, so to speak. So in many cases, marriages to relatives were dictated by the situation of who inherits what and how to avoid splitting the family property or letting somebody from the outside of the extended family uh, to have a claim on the property in question. Now we are coming to this bit uh, when mothers had realistic chances to never see their daughters again. Uh, women were mostly secluded to a special part of the household. So sometimes leaving the house wasn't really a simple task. Uh, usually you couldn't just go and visit somebody. And if a girl is married off to another town, uh, then yeah, it might be really hard for a mother to meet her. And since death during childbirth was very common and According to archaeologists, uh, there was a spike in the female mortality at the age of roughly uh, 16 or 17, uh, which is the birth of the first child. Uh, when the body of a mother is not fully formed for this task, and the state of uh, healthcare and in ancient Greece obviously wasn't very advanced, uh, yeah, for a significant number of mothers, the wedding of their daughter could be the last time uh, they see each other. So yeah, there's a, a lot more symbolism in the myth of uh, Persephone uh, than people usually think. And since modern society is quite different from ancient Greece, uh, this uh, symbolism can be perceived as quite disturbing. Okay, let's move to another myth. Uh, since I'm trying to link these myths uh, on the list and even introduce some uh, common themes, uh, it's going to be another myth uh, about Demeter. Demophon and Demeter. It is a short myth which helps me to establish certain things that will help me later on. So, Persephone is abducted by Hades. Demeter is looking for her daughter and cannot find her anywhere on Earth. 
uh, because she's not on Earth, uh, she is beneath. At some point, Demeter travels to the town of Eleusis, not far from Athens, uh, takes the form of an old woman and becomes a nurse of a boy called Demophon. Demophon is the son of the local king. She kind of gets attached to the boy and also wants to make some sort of a gift to his nice and hospitable parents, so she decides to make Demophon immortal. Cannibalism in the house of Atreus is disturbing, but immortality can be far more disturbing and far more frightening. Uh, that's why the myths I've selected for this list are mostly about immortality, in one way or another, or connected to this idea uh, somehow. You cannot just become immortal. It is a process. And in most cases, it involves fire. It's just uh, how it works. Uh, I'm not making this up. So Demeter regularly covers the, the boy uh, with ambrosia, the food of the gods, and then holds him over the fire. Uh, this is uh, quite comparable to one of the versions of the story of Achilles. Uh, one of the versions uh, involves ambrosia and fire, and uh, another is about the waters of river Styx. As you might expect, at some point Demeter is interrupted. Uh, the child's mother walks into the room and sees that the nurse uh, puts the kid into the hearth. And for some reason, she's uh, shocked and uh, becomes uh, hysterical. Uh, stupid woman. Uh, Demeter uh, didn't like this kind of attitude. Uh, she decided that she's not gonna tolerate this kind of tantrums and just abandons the process. Uh, tells everyone to screw themselves and uh, leaves the building. And the boy just uh, burns to death or whatever. Uh, Demeter just doesn't care. Uh, she's angry. Uh, that's very disturbing behavior and a very disturbing situation if you think about it uh, for a minute. Greek gods often act like uh, total psychopaths in the myths. And one uh, of the main explanations is they are immortal, and that's why they perceive things differently, and they are absolutely unbelievably narcissistic. There's also Plato's explanation that all of these stories were made up or corrupted uh, by people, and gods are in fact uh, perfect beings. Uh, they don't do anything wrong. Uh, the problem is the stories people tell about them. Obviously, there's another version of the myth about uh, Demophon. He actually survives in this version. But it seems that it wasn't that popular. Uh, in the end, uh, Demeter actually did something good for the royal family of uh, Eleusis. Uh, she taught Demophon's brother agriculture. And that's how we know about agriculture right now. Uh, if it wasn't for Demeter, uh, we'd still be foragers. Uh, so in the end, it doesn't matter much if she burned the baby to death. Uh, she wasn't a monster. She uh, wasn't uh, eating babies or something. Oh, wait. Tantalus and Pelops. Once upon a time, there was a king called Tantalus. He was a nice guy, and gods loved him a lot. Uh, he also was a son of Zeus, and a grandfather of Atreus, which means that the stories of cannibalism, incest, and matricide are just around the corner. Well, you know the story of uh, Tantalus. Uh, he was a prominent scholar. Uh, he was looking for the exact definition of the word hubris. There are different versions of the myth, because there are always different versions. Uh, he was doing a lot of interesting stuff. But in the end, uh, he was very successful. He found what he was looking for and got his reward. Some say uh, he was stealing ambrosia from the gods. Others, that he was uh, stealing their secrets. Or that he produced and directed the Death Stranding video game. 
but the most popular version is that he transformed himself into uh, Guy Fieri. Uh, he decided to cut his own son, Pelops, into pieces, uh, cook him until tender, and then uh, offer this one pot meal uh, to the gods during the feast on Olympus. Uh, he was dining there every now and then. Uh, the reason for that, well, hubris was the reason, but actually uh, there are versions and the most popular is that he decided to test the gods. You know, maybe they're not able to recognize the type of meat and Tantalus be like, haha, bamboozled, you're actually eating my son. The gods figured out what was going on. The only deity that actually started actively eating Pelops was Demeter. Uh, here's the link to the previous story I promised you before. Or maybe it was not Demeter, but somebody else, uh, because, you know, uh, there are versions. Uh, Demeter is just the most popular one. She was mourning the disappearance of her daughter and wasn't paying attention. The gods resurrected Pelops. Uh, he went to his disciples and started a new religion. No, he didn't. One part of his body was missing, eaten by Demeter. Unfortunately, it was his shoulder, so he managed to produce Atreus and Thaestis. And also like 20 other people, but that's not the point. Uh, the gods made him a new shoulder, made of ivory. And Tantalus, well, uh, they screwed him real good. They screwed him up big time. The most popular version? Tantalus is sitting in the underworld and is constantly hungry and thirsty. He sees food or water, and uh, every time he is trying to reach for it, everything disappears. So he stays hungry and thirsty for all eternity. This is one of these eternal torture stories, like Sisyphus or Ixi, who are not really within the scope of our today's video. Well, it is quite pointless to tell you the story of Sisyphus anyway. He's rolling his stone in the underworld for eternity. Although people usually don't know why the gods decided to punish him. And these stories are quite funny. At some point, uh, he chained uh, Thanatos, uh, essentially the god of death, and uh, also he ran away from the underworld. But then uh, there is Ixion, and Ixion also was a very funny guy as well. Uh, he was the first person to upload his uh, DNA into the cloud. Uh, but we'll talk about impregnating clouds some other time. Uh, Ixion is fastened uh, to a burning wheel, which he rotates for eternity. So yeah, eternal punishment is really disturbing, and the way Tantalus uh, deserved it uh, is quite disturbing as well. Pelops uh, turned out to be a much better person than his father, uh, which was uh, very easy to do, because the bar has been set like really, really low. Uh, but it was actually Pelops who received uh, this famous curse that wrecked his descendants. Uh, he decided to marry Hippodamia, the daughter of uh, Onameis, uh, the king of Pisa and Elis. Uh, the problem was that because of the prophecy that uh, uh, Onameis uh, will be killed by his son-in-law, this king was acting seriously weirdly. I should say disturbingly weirdly. I mean, uh, he was a far more weird character at this point than Pelops. Onameis organized a contest, a one-on-one -on -one chariot race against him. If the suitor wins, he gets his daughter. The problem here was that, first of all, he was distracting competitors using his daughter. Uh, second, he was essentially driving a Ferrari, while his rivals were driving a go-kart. Uh, he was giving the suitors a head start, then quickly chased them, and after winning the race, he just cut their heads off and nailed them at the front door of his house. As you do. Uh, so when Pelops arrived, he figured out that uh, this is a very unfair competition. Uh, he was definitely smarter than his predecessors, and there were like a dozen of suitors uh, who totally lost their heads over Hippodemia. 
Pelops uh, decided to stay in one piece. Uh, he didn't like being in more than one piece since uh, this incident when he became an Irish stew on his father's uh, cooking show. So he had a plan. Uh, fortunately, Hippodamia fell in love with Pelops, uh, which made things easier. Uh, together they conspired with a former driver of uh, Anameas, uh, his name was Myrtles. Uh, this Myrtles agreed to participate in a sabotage, and he tinkered uh, with the wheels of his master's chariot. He replaced the axle pins, to be precise. As a result, uh, Anameas uh, had an accident during the race and died. Hippodamia was apparently absolutely okay with this result. Uh, the myths contradict each other on what Pelops uh, promised Myrtilus uh, as a reward, if he actually promised anything. Uh, but everything comes down more or less to this. Myrtilus demanded to spend a night with Hippodamia as a payment. Modern idea that sharing your wife is not a big deal uh, wasn't very popular in ancient Greece. Uh, it is not even popular in modern Greece or in most countries of the world. Narrow-minded people, biggest everywhere. Anyway, Pelops was a respectable conservative man, so he just killed the guy. Uh, which is kind of understandable. I mean, yeah, he shouldn't have given this sort of promise in the first place. But uh, throwing Myrtilus into the sea was a logical decision. Kind of logical. Uh, I mean, Pelops should have disposed of Myrtilus quickly. But unfortunately for Pelops, this uh, throwing a guy into the sea is a process uh, which allowed Myrtilus to curse Pelops and all of his descendants as he was uh, approaching death. Pelops managed to function with the curse more or less uh, with only relatively serious problems nothing extremely outrageous, uh, but his descendants, oh, uh, they made Tantalus look like a good father. Tantalids are doing their thing. No list of mythological horrors is complete without the descendants of Tantalus. I wanted to skip the stories about the house of Atreus, uh, pretty much everybody knows them, but I absolutely have to mention them. I will do it in a very rapid fashion, but uh, as I've said before, I will try to emphasize a couple of frequently overlooked aspects. So, Pelops uh, received his curse from dying Myrtles, and uh, then he had children. Uh, the most prominent were Atreus and Thaestes, uh, the twins. Their mother was Hippodamia. Uh, they also had a half-brother, Chrysippus. Uh, they had a lot of siblings, actually, but Chrysippus, uh, well, uh, they killed him. Uh, their father obviously didn't like this at all, so he banished them and cursed them. Now Atreus and Thaestes had a double curse over their heads. They took a refuge in Mycenae. The local king died childless, and the oracle told that a child of Pelops should become the new king. Everyone decided to follow the advice, uh, now the question was, which of the sons exactly? The true brothers uh, agreed to resolve the dispute in a strange fashion. Thaestes proposed that the throne should go to the one who can display to everyone a golden fleece, a stunning artifact uh, that was in the possession of Atreus. We'll talk about the fleece later on. It will be featured in a couple of other disturbing stories on our list. So Atreus agreed with this weird proposal, only to find out that the fleece was stolen from him, because Thaestes was secretly having an affair with the wife of Atreus, and she gave the fleece to her lover. Uh, this plan backfired for Thaestes big time. Thaestes showed everyone the golden fleece. Atreus uh, then had a counter-proposal. Uh, Atreus becomes the king if the sun will change its course. For some reason, Thaestes didn't, didn't expect any foul play, so he accepted. But the sun actually immediately changed its course, so Atreus was declared the new king, and no amount of golden fleece could help Thaestes. 
Uh, how was Atreus able to perform such a stunning trick? Oh, uh, it wasn't his idea. It was the idea of Zeus, uh, who for some reason favored this particular grandchild, not the other one. Uh, so Zeus uh, did the trick and voila. Atreus immediately started demonstrating everyone that Zeus chose wisely. Uh, he figured out that his wife was unfaithful, and it obviously required some sort of revenge. Understandable. So he decided to emulate his famous grandfather, Tantalus, a little bit. Uh, he killed uh, the sons of Thaestes, cooked them according to the family recipe, and tricked their father into eating them. Uh, which is an overreaction even by very conservative standards. Thaestes started working on the counter-revenge plan, also understandable. Uh, somehow uh, this plan included uh, incest. Uh, Thaestes wasn't very conservative, he was very open-minded about uh, things. Uh, the oracle told him that a son born from his uh, relationship with his daughter will be able to kill Atreus. So Thaestes traveled to Sicyon uh, to his daughter Lope and said, okay, here's the plan. Uh, it may sound a little strange, but daddy knows best. Uh, no, he just raped her. And uh, the girl didn't know who the rapist was, uh, but she stole his sword, uh, which later became an important part of, this, of the story, which unfolded like a Bollywood movie. I need to double check uh, if they made an adaptation of this myth in India. Uh, in short, uh, Pelopia married Atreus, of all people, uh, abandoned the child, but Atreus found him and raised him. Uh, his name was Aegisthus. Uh, when he grew up, uh, Atreus sent Aegisthus to capture Thaestes, bring him back, and then kill him. Aegisthus, uh, or Agamemnon and Menelaus, uh, the children of Atreus, uh, brought Thaestes back. But it was the third act of the Bollywood movie, or Seneca's tragedy. Uh, everyone found out everything. Pelopia immediately killed herself, and Aegisthus suddenly decided that, okay, he should kill Atreus instead. So he killed Atreus, took control of uh, Mycenae, and ruled there with his father. Until Agamemnon and Menelaus uh, took Mycenae back, uh, Aegisthus and uh, Thaestes had to leave. Thaestes later died, but Aegisthus uh, waited until Agamemnon and Menelaus went to Troy, came back and seduced Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra. This story just doesn't end, but we're getting close. Anyway, Agamemnon and Menelaus had their own share of troubles, and when Agamemnon finally came back home, as you all know, he was killed by Clytemnestra and her lover. And here comes Orestes, the man who lifted the curse of his family. Orestes, the son of Agamemnon, and one of the most prominent characters of ancient Greek tragedies. Orestes, uh, who escaped the massacre that took the lives of Agamemnon and, by the way, uh, his concubine Cassandra. Uh, the tragedy of Orestes is that it was his duty to avenge his father's death. But since the murderer was his mother, uh, well, it calls for matricide. Uh, a terrible sin. Uh, but Apollo told him that, you know, that's fine, just go and, and do it. You know, something like seven years after Agamemnon's death, Orestes, with the help from his sister Electra, actually manages to uh, snip away and sever this uh, umbilical uh, residue, uh, keeping me from killing you. Uh, he kills both Clytemnestra and uh, Aegisthus. Obviously, Irenes, or the Furies, the goddesses of vengeance, appear and start chasing Orestes, because uh, now he has to pay for matricide, uh, go and tell Apollo that it was justified. Uh, eventually, they all hold a trial in Athens, where Apollo successfully defended Orestes, and in the end, the curse was lifted. 
The problem here is that, well, as you know, Orestes was very popular with Greek playwrights. And some of the main sources for this myth uh, come from the surviving Greek tragedies of our Holy Trinity, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. And their versions actually give us some more disturbing and funny uh, details, uh, which are sometimes overlooked. First of all, the version of Euripides uh, presents Orestes, uh, Pylades, and Electra as essentially thugs. Uh, Euripides apparently was a huge fan of revisionism and the reinterpretation of the myths. Uh, in his tragedy Electra, he even makes fun of Aeschylus and his play The Libation Bearers. And in his play Orestes, uh, a sequel to Electra, uh, this team of uh, rascals, uh, Orestes, Pylades, and Electra, uh, uh, they uh, devise a plan to uh, kill Helen, uh, their aunt, by the way, uh, in order to escape uh, once uh, it is all done, uh, they intend to take uh, her daughter, Hermione, a cousin of Orestes and Electra, as a hostage. Hermione, by the way, later becomes a wife of Orestes. Uh, so yeah, the uh, interpretation of Orestes in Euripides is very... Uh, well, uh, he's not much better than his father or grandfather. I mean, Orestes, not Euripides. The earliest cycle of tragedies about Orestes and his adventures is Oresteia uh, by Aeschylus. It is a trilogy which consists of Agamemnon, the Libation Bearers, and the Eumenides. Uh, the last part, the Eumenides, uh, which is dedicated to this court hearing about Orestes and whether he should be pardoned, so to speak, uh, the Eumenides uh, give us one interesting and quite disturbing detail. One of the reasons why Orestes uh, was found essentially not guilty of matricide is uh, because a mother is not really a blood relative of a child, uh, which is confirmed by Apollo, and quite possibly Aeschylus was pretty much in favor of this uh, very uh, scientific theory. Somehow this aspect is frequently overlooked when people tell the story of the House of Atreus. And yes, it is not as disturbing as the stories of people eating each other, but it is quite disturbing on its own, especially the implications of this concept. Uh, the idea was that uh, well, a mother is just a vessel. A child grows inside of her, but they don't really share blood. Uh, the real parent is the father. It's his seed, and woman is just a soil where this where this seed grows. Uh, so uh, she's not entirely a parent, uh, not really a blood relative. Let's talk about motherhood. Uh, some more. The Minotaur. As you might know, the Minotaur has an incredibly weird origin story. It's quite disturbing in itself, uh, but there was a lot of stuff going on around, so the interconnected myths give everything some extra layers of weirdness. Minos became the king of Crete. And in order to prove to his brothers, uh, who also claimed the throne, that, that uh, in fact it was he, Minos, who was chosen by the gods, he asked Poseidon to make a wonderful uh, white bull appear from the sea, uh, which he did. And this majestic creature was supposed to be offered to Poseidon again as a sacrifice. But Minos liked the bull so much that he abandoned the initial plan and decided to keep this beautiful animal to himself. Poseidon wasn't impressed, so he made this bull mad and uh, he was running around terrorizing everyone. So this is the famous uh, Cretan bull, uh, the same bull from the story about Heracles, and also the same bull who was later killed at Marathon by Theseus. So Theseus, uh, Theseus killed both the bull and his son. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Making the bull mad wasn't the only punishment imposed by Poseidon. 
or by some other gods, because once again, uh, there are different versions of pretty much any myth imaginable. Uh, but the result was the same. Some god uh, cursed the wife of uh, Minos, uh, Pasiphae, uh, and filled her with incredible lust for the bull. Uh, you might think that it wasn't quite fair to punish Pasiphae, uh, for the faults of her husband. But first of all, ancient Greeks uh, could have a different opinion. And second, the alternative versions uh, name other gods as the source of the curse. For example, Aphrodite, who had a personal grudge against uh, Pasiphae, uh, or possibly against uh, her father. And her father was uh, Helios, uh, the sun god. And just like uh, some other descendants of the sun god, she was a sorceress like Cersei, or more accurately, Kirke, uh, who was her sister, or like Medea, the granddaughter of Helios. And she used to hear sorcery every now and then. So, before we'll move to the stories about bestiality, here is some warm-up for you. Minos was not only a powerful king and wise lawmaker, he also was an incredible womanizer. He had a huge number of children from almost everybody. And his animal-loving wife somehow didn't like her husband's uh, polyamorous activities. So she used a magic spell. Now, Minos had an interesting curse. Every time he sleeps with some other woman, serpents emerge from his body and eat the girl alive. I'm not sure if it worked with men, though. Probably not. Uh, Minos is sometimes credited as the originator of the idea of homosexuality. In one uh, version of the myth, it is he, not Zeus, who abducts uh, Ganymede. Uh, also, uh, do you know why and how he reconciled with uh, Theseus after our brave Athenian hero killed the Minotaur and stole his daughter? I mean, reconciled to a point, a point of a very friendly relationship when he gave him another daughter, Phaedra, uh, to become his wife. Well, apparently, Minos was quite ready to sleep with everybody, except probably for the white bull. Anyway, somehow Minos found this serpent curse quite inconvenient, and in the end, uh, it was lifted by a girl called Procris, uh, who is quite a hilarious character herself. And now the warm-up is over, the serpents are gone, Back to bestiality. Pacifei uh, decided to resolve her problem in a very interesting fashion. She asked Daedalus to build a wooden cow, the Cretan cow, so to speak, a predecessor of the Trojan horse. And Pacifei uh, uh, was sitting inside this structure waiting uh, for the bull. That's how they tricked him. Uh, the bull thought he was copulating with the cow, but in fact he was Bamboozle. Uh, since we're dealing with the Greek myths, where everyone always gets pregnant, including clouds, uh, Pacifae uh, became pregnant as well, uh, because uh, this is uh, how interspecies breeding worked in ancient Greece. If you mate a human and a bull, uh, the result will be a half human, half bull. That's very logical. And if you made a human and a cloud, by the way, uh, the result will be a half human, a half uh, horse. It's just how stuff works. This half human, half bull is obviously our old friend, the Minotaur. Uh, that's not really his name. His name was Asterion or Asterius. Uh, he probably had hopes and dreams and wanted to become a lyrical poet. Uh, but his stepfather, King Minos, had a better idea. Little pig boy comes from the dirt. <laughs> and the uh, idea, uh, which, uh, if you'll think about it for a moment, is probably more uh, disturbing than the story about bestiality. He locked the Minotaur in a gigantic structure, uh, the labyrinth, specifically designed uh, by Daedalus, obviously. The Minotaur wanted to eat, uh, so, as you know, Minos provided him with seven young men and seven girls every year, uh, who were sent to Crete from Athens as a tribute. Uh, 
uh, which was another astonishingly messed up idea of Minus. Not only he was uh, sentencing innocent people to absolutely brutal death in purposely built dungeon, but uh, he also was torturing uh, the Minotaur, uh, because 14 uh, relatively skinny Greeks were obviously not enough to nourish uh, poor Asterion for the whole year, uh, unless he had some sort of a fridge in the labyrinth to preserve meat from rotting, which gives you uh, 1.17 human a month. Uh, which is manageable. Uh, probably somewhere around two, two and a half kilos or five pounds of flesh and bones a day. Uh, no veggies. So uh, it is not a healthy diet, especially for a half bull, and bulls are not exactly carnivores. As you probably know, it is believed that this myth reflects the power of the Menon civilization in the Mediterranean in the times before the so-called Greek Dark Ages. And the remains of the palace in uh, Knossos, Knossos, uh, Knossos, 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 were probably uh, the inspiration for the whole idea of this labyrinth. Uh, or maybe not. In any case, uh, one of the batches of uh, victims from Athens included Theseus. So Theseus uh, killed the Minotaur, grabbed Ariadne, and they lived happily ever after. No, not really. Uh, but we'll talk about Theseus in the second part of this video. That's all for today. Uh, you have some nice bedtime stories uh, you can tell your children. So you could prepare them for the hardships uh, of life and give them the understanding that death is not the worst thing that may happen to a human being. Also, they should be grateful that you don't boil them and don't try to feed their succulent infant flesh to their grandfather. Thank you for watching and see you in the next part of the video about disturbing Greek myths.